1990, an old woman died in a one-room tenement in Ahmedabad, alone and forgotten. She had spent her life in the shadow of her illustrious father. After his death, she lived to keep his memory alive. She was Mani Ben, the daughter of Sardar Vallabhai Patel. Sardar Patel, the silent colossus on the Indian political scene, the great organizer, the Iron Man of India, who brought about the formidable task of integrating the 565 princely states into the Indian Union. Sardar Patel, who organized the strength to actualize Gandhi's and Nehru's dreams. The great man of action, the likes of whom were never again to be seen. Yet who only wore clothes spun by his daughter, whose kurta, when he visited the Nizam of Hyderabad, had eight patches on it, who bequeathed no power to his children and left 200 rupees in his bank when he died. The historic Sabarmati River in Ahmedabad, from the banks of which Gandhi led the national struggle till 1928. Also on its banks, a little further away, is another historic monument, Shahi Bagh. It is today a memorial to Sardar Patel, and like all memorials and statues, a symbol of our struggle against forgetting. And yet memories cannot be lived fossilized. Today, when our public life has been marred by deep erosion of values, the time has come to take the memories of great leaders like the Sardar out of the deep freeze of museums and into our present. See, persistent efforts which have been made to belittle Sardar's role in Indian history has definitely some effect in making people forget his tremendous contribution. But as a person, Sardar is being remembered more and more. He was a man of crisis and he was a troubleshooter. So every time that nation is facing a trouble, people start remembering him with nostalgia. Even those people who criticized him during his lifetime, uh, socialists like J.P. and Madhulimiye or communists like uh, Namudripad and Jyoti Basu, they all confess that they have made a mistake in evaluating Sardar. Why is there such a deep unconscious association of a man with times of crisis? Is it because, like some father figure, he reminds us of a firm and responsible handling of trouble in the past? Safdarjang Airport, then Willingdon Airfield. The Sardar was here on the 27th of October 1947, watching a sortie start and another end and waiting for the return of VP Menon with news from Kashmir. Kashmir was one of the 565 princely states in existence then. 565 princely states, some smaller than 5 square kilometers, but all pampered by the British and allowed to live under the illusion of being free and given the option of joining either India, Pakistan or remaining independent. What would the new India have been like minus the princely states and minus Pakistan. A mutilated land with its edges crumbling, its fabric ridden with innumerable holes, holes that could easily tear apart the nation to shreds. It was in the strategic interests of all concerned that this be prevented. The job of integrating these princely states into the Indian Union required great tact, diplomacy and a deep understanding of human nature. The Sardar convinced all the states to join in, with the exception of Kashmir, Junagadh and Hyderabad. Junagadh caved in, but there had to be police action before the Nizam of Hyderabad surrendered. Uh, Sardar Patel was really best suited uh, for this task. Uh, from October 1946, well before independence, he had made the matter of the states his own. Uh, his record was also extremely um, appropriate because although he had fought against the Rajkot uh, ruler in 1939, he did not have the image of somebody who was hostile to the Rajas and Maharajas. So when in June of 1947, he officially became 
uh, in charge of the state's question on behalf of the government. This was even before August 15. Uh, it was uh, a move that was uh, liked by the Rajas and Maharajas and even the Nawabs. He started wooing the Maharajas uh, really from the month of May in 47 and one by one supported by his team in the Ministry of States. Uh, he uh, wore down any resistance that they had to acceding to India. He also was very astute in fully uh, employing the uh, possibilities made available by Mountbatten, the Viceroy. It's true that uh, his combination of firmness and tact uh, was also allied to this uh, offer of the privy purse to uh, the princes. But of, it was a very small price to pay for the accession and integration into India of 560 plus states. Nidyad, a small town halfway between Andhrabad and Baroda in Gujarat. It was a town of twisting streets and 25,000 people when Vallabhai was born here. His mother, Ladba, gave him birth in an inner room of this house, belonging to her brother, Dungir Bhai, where she had come for her confinement. Vallabhai's childhood was spent not in Nadiad, but in Karansad, 12 miles north, where his father, Zaveer Bhai, tilled a 10-acre plot and owned a house. Vallabhai's parents had six children. Vallabhai was the fourth. It is conjectured by some that this status of being a middle child had a share in the making of his extraordinarily strong and independent personality. Zaverbai was burdened with debt and his involvement in the Swami Narayan sect led him to become more and more a recluse and detached from his home. Deprived of adequate parental love, remembered last when clothes and sweets had to be shared, and first, when any work needed to be done, Vallabhai learned very early to fend for himself. At school, interesting character traits began to reveal themselves in the personality of little Vallabh. The Nadiad High School saw the emergence of a rebellious, mischievous, but witty schoolboy who played little tricks on his teachers and regaled his friends with puns and jokes. The school register recording Vallabhai's name still exists. His strong willful character and resistance to injustice, even at the cost of incurring the wrath of his teachers, earned him the names Stormy and Outlaw. A teacher once asked Vallabhai, So have you brought the 200 paras? In Gujarati, para meant tables but it meant buffaloes as well. Vallabhai replied, Sir, I did bring 200 paras, but two of them were rogues. They turned wild at the school gate and turned around and scared away the rest of the paras as well. Vallabhai's family was indifferent to his education. He could easily, like his brothers Soma and Narsi, have taken to tilling the land, but he had other plans for himself. At the age of 22, he passed his metric and later qualified as a district pleader. And then he began to save up money for his dream, to go to England for his barristership. The most striking feature of Vallabhai's personality was always his great capacity for sacrifice, for taking second place and doing so gracefully and in complete silence. The England story is one very early indication of this remarkable ability. Sardar had set his mind on becoming a barrister by going to England. He was saving for a number of years. He had even prepared his passport. But when his elder brother came to know about it, he said that the passport is VJ Patel, so I can also go. Sardar very willingly handed him over the passport, the entire savings that he had collected. He even agreed to maintain his wife in his absence. On Vithal Bhai's return, Vallabh Bhai wanted to leave for England. But it was not to be. His wife Zaverba died suddenly of an intestinal ailment at the tender age of 29 years.
Zaverba is one aspect of Vallabhai's life that remains a mystery. Her children were too young to remember her and Vallabhai characteristically never spoke of her. What was the nature and intensity of their relationship will never be known. Vallabhai never remarried. When he actually set out for his barristership to England, he was a man already 35 years of age. In him, a down-to-earth patidar, a widower who had saved money for it twice over, was going to England. Not a young romantic or a political anarchist. He knew he had not much time. And ultimately, finally, when he could go to England, he was more than 35. He had no time and he concentrated on his study. He was the first to attend and enter the bar library, last one to leave. He cut down on all social contacts. He never even went to see the number of Indian revolutionaries who were there. Concentrated on the studies, um, passed out the examinations with fine colors in record time and rushed back home to his family, to his responsibilities and to his profession. Only a few yards away from the courts in Ahmedabad is the Gujarat club, where many lawyers would assemble to play bridge, smoke, gossip and discuss politics. When Vallabhai returned from England and set up a successful practice as a criminal lawyer, he spent many evenings here playing bridge. Vallabhai in 1913 Clients who met him spoke of his piercing dark eyes. He was in the habit of staring hard at the other person, making him waver and withdraw. At the club, Vallabhai discovered that he was quite good at bridge. The image of Vallabhai Patel during this time is quite unlike that to be expected of a future nationalist leader. He smoked, played bridge, wore European clothes and sent his children to English schools. Just across the street from the Gujarat club was Vallabhai's Bhadra house. At this juncture, his interest in politics was minimal. He was scornful of the methods of the Indian nationalists, which then revolved around either making petitions or throwing bombs. And then in 1915, an event of staggering importance took place. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi arrived on the Indian national scene from South Africa with his new weapon of the Satyagraha. Vallabhai greeted this news with skepticism. One day when Gandhi arrived in the Gujarat club to address a meeting, Vallabhai talked of him from his bridge table with great sarcasm and made everybody laugh. However, destiny had planned otherwise. Vallabhai, like many others, would soon be irrevocably drawn into Gandhi's magnetic field, never to return to his earlier life. When I joined Gandhiji, I collected some firewood, lit a fire and put all considerations of my family, my career, my reputation and everything into the fire. I do not know what would be left of these, except the ashes. Sardar's life is peculiar, something which is completely different from any other person. His life is divided into two watertight compartments. In the first compartment, Sardar is totally, fully, entirely devoted to his family affairs. He has no interest in public life. He will not meet anybody, he will not bother about anybody, he didn't join political party, did nothing. In the second half, after he entered the public life, he completely and totally forgot his own family affairs. He never bothered about family income, family circumstances, marriage of his children, training of them, educating them. He was completely, totally, entirely devoted to public life. So, these type of watertight compartments you will not find in the life of any other person in history. This is a peculiar um, trait of Sardar. It seems very apparent in retrospect that here was somebody who was just waiting for a chance for renunciation, for something meaningful to come up to which he could offer up his life. 
It was to this waiting spirit in Vallabhai that Gandhi showed the way. Armed struggle rarely led to the arms being laid down after the struggle was won. Gandhi appeared onto the national scene with a new weapon, that of Satyagra or non-violent resistance to oppression. The method had already proved effective in Champaran. Vallabhai, the man of action, was impressed. He joined the Kheda and Nagpur flag Satyagras as Gandhi's lieutenant and in the days spent by his side, he silently observed Gandhi's methods. Thus began a 30-year relationship between Gandhi and Vallabhai, which was to have such a significant impact on the struggle for Indian independence. The non-cooperation movement was launched on a national scale by Gandhi, but violence at Chauri Chaura in February 1922 made him withdraw the movement. In the years that followed, he decided to strengthen and prepare the people for non-violent struggle, and there was a political lull. The political lull was broken by the events of 1928, the first of which was initiated by the Raj, the Simon Commission. The second and more important was initiated by the people of the Bardoli Taluka in Gujarat. They launched a struggle against an unjust increase in land tax levied by the government. The Bardoli Satyagra was a successful demonstration of Gandhi's methods on a large scale. Vallabhai's house in the Swaraj ashram in Bardoli. Vallabhai's was the room on the right and on the left was his daughter Mani Benz. Some of the fruit trees in the garden were planted by Vallabhai himself. Even long after the Bardoli struggle was won, the house and the Swaraj ashram continued to be the center of political activity in Gujarat. Uttam Chand Shah, then the secretary of the ashram, is today 99 not out, as he says. As a close associate of the Sardar, he was a witness to all the political upheavals that took place here, during Bardoli and after. Today, his daughter Niranjana Ben manages the ashram, which also runs a school for tribal girls. I am 99, Pravesh. In October, I am in 99. I have finished 98. An old Haveli in Bardoli. These quiet houses and lanes.